I want to lay out for about 10 minutes the basic theme of the book, uh, the basic frame, uh, so people have a way to respond to what, we're, what our analysis is. All governing systems today, from Singapore to China to the US to Europe, are experiencing disequilibrium because of the combined impact of globalization and technological advance. In this book, we argue that we are in the midst of the great transition from American-led globalization 1.0 to what we call globalization 2.0, due to the rise of the rest, the emerging economies. Thanks to the convergence of patterns of growth and the spread of technology, the emerging economies from China to Turkey to Brazil are leveling the playing field. However, far from becoming a flat world, economic strength engenders cultural and political self-assertion. Witness the neo-Confucian caste of China, the neo-Ottoman caste of Turkey, the two fastest growing economies in the world. Thus, the new uh, technological and economic convergence also entails a new divergence. Globalization 2.0 is, above all, an interdependence of plural identities. As diversity grows among cultures and nations, it is also growing within societies because of the demassification of standardized industrial society, the proliferation of tribes, identities, and niches by the, caused by the information revolution, especially social media. Greater diversity along with cultural and political awakening is part and parcel of this transition underway between globalization 1.0 and 2.0. From Tahrir Square to the indignados in Spain to the villagers in Wukong in China, people are demanding the dignity of meaningful participation in the way their lives are governed. This presents a double challenge to governance. To accommodate the demand for participation, power must be devolved downward toward the grassroots. At the same time, greater consensus building institutional capacity, such as associated with political meritocracies, and we can discuss that term later in China and in Singapore, for example, greater institutional capacity is required to manage the systemic links of interdependence and the greater complexity of diversity. The failure to find an institutional response to this, this double challenge will result in a crisis of legitimacy either because inclusive growth and employment can't be provided or because of a democratic deficit in which voices aren't heard. So in the book, we talk about uh, an operating system, devolve, involve, and decision division, which tries to reconcile democracy rooted in popular sovereignty, knowledgeable democracy, with accountable meritocracy. What we do in the book is then engage uh, in a uh, political act of political imagination to imagine what an ideal construct might be uh, and then we, uh, I guess we'll discuss tomorrow night, we go through the various projects we have in California at the G20 level in Europe about putting these ideas into, into practice. Now, since every place starts from a different point of disequilibrium, the responses are different. In China, you need more accountability, more transparency, more rule of law, etc. In the United States, you need more uh, consensus building institutions that are insulated from direct politics with a short-term and special interest culture that dominates. In Europe, you have a commission which is meritocratic in nature but lacks democratic legitimacy. So different places have to respond to equilibrium in different ways, disequilibrium. <clears throat> now in the book, we focus on China and the US as the core systems of a global order. Not as little alternatives, of course, but as a metaphor to help identify the trade-offs between popular sovereignty of democracy on the one hand and long-term horizon of meritocratic, meritocratic elites on the other hand. China continues to adhere to the centuries-long attributes of its institutional civilization rooted in rule by expertise and experience of tested elites. True to its no-party Confucian roots, China today operates under a one-party system in which consensus is reached through internal competition based on performance instead of external competition where different constituencies of the body politic are mobilized against each other. Once consensus is reached, this enables a greater unity of purpose in the effective long-term implementation of policies. Now, the US, of course, is the largest and most dynamic of the one-person, one-vote electoral democracies. Within the US, in the book, we focus on California, since it carries this idea furthest through direct, the direct democracy of the initiative process, where voters can make laws and change the Constitution directly. As is often the case, the extreme reveals the essence. California most exposes the problems with democracy taken to the extreme. It's also a bellwether for where the rest of the United States is going, and perhaps with the pressure for participation, direct democracy is where many people want to head. 
Now, we don't discuss in this, in this talk the Westminster system and others. We can talk about that, that in questions if you like. A couple of comments about how we arrived at this, uh, this way of looking at the world. It's a tale of two systems, in effect. Uh, when Nicholas and I sat down in California, I recalled a visit I had with Governor Jerry Brown of California. He's governor again now and was governed before most of you were born in <laughs> the 1970s. And I went to, this 35 years ago, I went with Governor Brown to China. Then still backward, impoverished from the Cultural Revolution that couldn't even feed itself. Shenzhen and the Pearl River Delta, now the factory of the world, was merely a village. Ground was being broken on the Three Gorges Dam and bicycles still dominated uh, Beijing and Shanghai and other places. Everyone knows what has happened since. 400 million people have been lifted out of poverty. High-speed rail networks connect megacities with state-of-the-art subways underneath. Shanghai schools test the best in the, uh, globally, and China's the second largest economy in the world. Now, in those same 35 years, California, the bellwether state, that once dreamed of building a society as magnificent as, as its landscape, has ended up with mountains of debt, disappearing jobs, D-plus schools, greater spending on prisons than higher education, and crumbling infrastructure that China puts to shame. Now, of course, China is a developing country, and the U.S. is an advanced economy, particularly California. Despite China's well-known problems, however, the sensational exposure which we are seeing today with uh, Bo Jilai and Wen Jibao and, and the turmoil leading up to the 18th Congress, despite these sensational exposure of problems, pervasive corruption, vast inequality, and so on, it was clear that the modern meritocratic mandarinate at the heart of the nominally communist system with its unity of purpose and long-term institutional capacity to implement policies had presided over the single most impressive alleviation of poverty in history. It was equally clear that despite being the birthplace of Apple, Google, and Facebook, California's public space had deteriorated because its democracy had become dysfunctional, captured by short-term special interest political culture. Therefore, the conventional observation in our book is what everybody knows. <clears throat> China's system is not self-correcting without reforms, rule of law, more accountability, more transparency, what's being discussed these very days. The unconventional con con observation in our book is that democracy, especially in the US as it is practiced, is no more self-correcting than financial markets. Despite one person, one vote elections, without reforms that institute consensus building institutions with a long-term horizon to offset and balance the short-term and special interest political culture that American democracy has come. Three quick reasons why democracy is not self-correcting, and then I'll finish. First, we are no longer living in the United States in particular in an industrial democracy, but a consumer democracy. In a democracy, people get what they want. In a consumer, consumer democracy, people get what they want when they want it, which is now. All feedback signals in a consumer democracy, media, market, politics, steer behavior toward immediate self-gratification. We now live in a kind of Diet Coke culture where just as people want sweetness without calories, they want consumption without savings, infrastructure and education without taxes. The same California voter that doesn't want to pay $50 on a license fee to pay for police and fire will spend $300 or more on the latest iPhone. This driving ethos of consumer democracy invites populism that can't be paid for. It's easy to see from this dynamic how the self-interest of immediate gratification results in exuberant bubbles, mountains of debt, and fiscal crisis. Second, deliberative institutions that enlarge the public view have largely withered and be overtaken, been overtaken by partisan rancor and the narrow short-term horizon of the voting public. The resulting gridlock and inability to find consensus has paralyzed governance. We already see halting efforts to respond to this phenomenon, this, this consensus, um, in the United States with the super committee of the Congress, the, the Republicans and Democrats couldn't get, get their act together. They tried to form a super committee of a small group of wise guys to figure out the fiscal deficit. They couldn't do it. Mario Monti in Italy is another example, the technocratic government, of a government being put in place to try to solve the problems, politics as usual, because it's so divided and, and full of disconsensus they could not get to. <clears throat> There's a growing recognition that without del when deliberative bodies wither, Inclusive politics dies, and the seeming rationality of short-term fixes at the ballot box can result in wholesale problems of irrational exuberance and debt and fiscal crisis, as I mentioned. In California, for example, as I, as I also mentioned, we ended up with the 
uh, consequence of spending more on prisons and higher education after a series of individually rational decisions to be tough on crime and uh, to cut property taxes. The ungovernability problem in California is that a result of undeliberated direct democracy through initiatives, ballot box mandates by citizens have lacked, locked in spending and locked out revenues. Finally, uh, Francis Fukuyama has argued that American uh, democracy has decayed into a vetocracy. By this he means the general will and long-term fiscal health of the system have been subverted by special interest lobbies and the short-term mentality of ideologically rigid or narrowly focused constituency. These organized groups from teachers to the oil and financial lobbies have amassed the clout to veto whatever threatens their hold on government and its spoils. They accrete to the system like barnacles and anchor it in the past. A vote for this decayed form of democracy is a vote for the past because a vote for the vested interests of the present that have staked their claim over years on the state. A system like this is almost guaranteed to generate debts and deficits. In conclusion, we are not, of course, making the case that China is a better system than the US or vice versa, that each should adopt each other's way. The United States is not going to become Confucian. China is not going to become a multi-party democracy anytime soon. What we're trying to do again is use these core systems to identify as a, as a metaphor the trade-offs between popular sovereignty and institutional capacity. In our view, the best system of governance would be a balance between the long-term horizon, knowledge-based, and consensus-forming attributes of meritocracy and the accountability of popular sovereignty. Further, we argue, the combination of knowledgeable democracy and accountable meritocracy is not far from the vision of the American founding fathers who designed institutions to ward off both monarch and mob. So thank you very much. I'll, st I'll stop with that.